Today we'll be taking a look at the history of Kriegspiel, the 19th century Prussian war game which was amongst the first systems to simulate warfare in a realistic manner, and which serves as the foundation for much of our own tabletop gaming. Thanks is owed to our sponsor, Audible, for making this video possible. The term wargaming is quite broad and can refer to any activity which seeks to realistically represent warfare. This has been attempted in various ways throughout history. Perhaps the most enduring of these is the game of chess, which is believed to have originated around the 5th century. Beloved by countless kings and nobles, it spread rapidly around the world and has been tweaked endlessly over the years. However, while the game has great entertainment value and can even help people train their strategic thinking, one would be hard pressed to use it as a genuine war simulator. This fact was rather vexing for many military enthusiasts who attempted to morph the game into something more practical. Over the centuries, the board, the pieces, the rules, and even the number of players would be tweaked in all sorts of fascinating ways. One of the most interesting variants would be developed by Christoph Weichmann in 1664. Dubbed the newly invented great game of kings, he would push the traditional adaptations much further by expanding the complexity of the pieces to 36, each with their own correspondence to contemporary roles of marshal, colonel, herald, and soldiers, and more. Most important would be his abandonment of the square grid system for a more flexible circular one that allowed for movement in many directions. In the following century, many would follow up with their own adaptations of this great game. These innovations would eventually break from the traditional principles of chess to establish something new. Johann Helwig, a professor at Brunswick in the late 1700s, would be the first true pioneer in this new field. While attempting to instruct students on military sciences, he eventually published the first edition of his own Kriegspiel, the German word for war game, in 1780. To quote author John Peterson, the significance of his work was that, quote, Helwig fundamentally reconsidered movement and displacement, conceived of novel victory conditions, and furnished his game with a concrete rather than abstract setting, both in terms of terrain and combatants. As you can see, the black and white grid of chess has been replaced with the colorized version of the terrain, which can impose restrictions on movement or confer combat advantages. Terrain might also change as cities, villages, and fortifications rise or fall, and as bridges or supply lines were established. This was all customizable based on the scenario being simulated. The units are also of note as they now represented a multitude of contemporary troops which could be deployed as players saw fit at the start of play before advancing in any direction. In addition, combat saw additional tweaks, such as the introduction of a strength system to determine the outcome of certain encounters like assaults on fortifications. A second edition of the game would be released in 1803, which introduced additional novelties. These included the addition of custom miniature figures, and new aspects of conflict resolution, such as the consideration for unit direction, and the breaking of movement and battle into two distinct phases within the same turn. Increasingly, the game was being sold on a commercial basis, and was used by a wider and wider audience. Helwig's game spawned numerous contemporary imitators. Their work would synergize marvelously with the advent of advanced cartography in the 19th century. As we discussed in another episode, for most of the past our ancestors viewed the world from the ground level rather than from the perspective of a bird. Their maps were abstract representations of reality, without a proper way to determine and represent things accurately. This was not a huge deal for relatively simple aspects of warfare of the time. However, the advent of gunpowder and the explosion in the complexities of war necessitated more details. The Renaissance and ensuing periods of scientific advancement would make this increasingly attainable. In the early 1800s, European general staffs dedicated huge amounts of time to surveying and cartography as they prepared to wage their continental wars on a scale never seen before. This would have huge implications on the wargaming community. To quote John Peterson once more, Once you have a map with a scale, even one as rough as one square mile equating 2,000 paces, you have opened the door to a far greater degree of realism in wargaming. In wargames, Scale is a tool that binds the system to the setting. Given that soldiers in the game march a certain number of squares in a turn, that number can now be converted into an absolute distance of which we can ask, how long would it take real soldiers to cross that distance? That gives us a sense of the real duration of turns. We can then research the distance that light and heavy cavalry might plausibly travel in the same duration, and determine whether or not their movement is realistically proportioned to that of infantry in the game system. 
We might similarly compare the actual distance that various forms of artillery can shoot with the established spatial distance of the game squares and tune the game behavior of artillery accordingly. With a consistent scale, a game ceases to be an abstraction like the game of chess, and begins to evolve towards something entirely novel, a simulation. I hope this passage gives you a sense of why accurate cartography was so important to the development of wargaming. I'll also note that if you were looking for some of the best cartography of the period, you would look no further than Prussia. They were the masters of the field, having vowed never to suffer the humiliating defeats they had faced at the hands of Napoleon in the early days of the War of the Fourth Coalition. It would be here that the famous Kriegspiel was devised. The inventor of this new war game was George Leopold von Reiswitz. He had grown up learning military history under the tutelage of his veteran father and became one of the early adopters of Helwig's game we discussed previously. This must have been quite the escapist experience for the youth, who dreamed of military campaigns that he could not attend due to an injury on his arm. In college, Reiswitz would share his passion for wargaming with his friends. Unable to afford the expensive game of Helwig, they built their own bootleg version themselves. They would elaborate on the system together and even devise a means to play through mail correspondence upon graduating. In 1810, Reiswitz would reunite with one of his school buddies to share notes about further improving the game. They concluded that the grid system fundamentally restricted the accuracy of wargaming and would begin to experiment with alternate system. Reiswitz eventually settled on using damp sand to sculpt realistic terrain and devised new rules to accompany this gridless system. Their experiments attracted attention in educated Prussian circles. Soon, Reichswitz would be invited to Berlin to make a demonstration before the princes. He would bring with him a massive, hand-sculpted model complete with hills, valleys, rivers, and roads at extreme levels of detail. The model was at a much higher resolution than previous systems, with battlefield units being represented as colored cubes that could be moved freely. The demonstration immediately captured the imagination of the crowd, and the king himself now expressed interest. Reiswitz, however, was not prepared to present a glorified sandbox to his sovereign. He therefore took a year to prepare a more suitable demonstration. In 1812, Reiswitz would return to the palace with the following. It was in the shape of a large table, open at the top for terrain to fit into. The terrain pieces were 3 to 4 inches square, and the overall area was at least 6 feet square. The small squares could be rearranged so that a multiplicity of landscapes was possible. The terrain was made in plaster and was colored to show roads, villages, swamps, rivers, etc. In addition, there were dividers for measuring distances, rulers, small boxes for placing over areas so that troops who were unobserved might make surprise attacks, and written rules which were at this stage not yet in their fuller form. The pieces to represent troops were made of porcelain. The whole thing was extremely well painted. The game certainly made a great impression, and was played frequently by members of the royalty and nobility. However, the main drawback was that it was a custom-built gift for a monarch, which was ill-suited for wider distribution. Ultimately, it would be Reichswitz's son, George Henrik Rudolf Johann von Reichswitz, who would bring about the game's further evolution. Unlike his father, Reichswitz Jr. was heavily involved in actual combat. He was amongst the many young Prussians who joined the military to fight Napoleon and quickly advanced through the military ranks, earning an Iron Cross for his gallantry in 1813. After the war, the youth would become attached to the Prussian artillery and eventually served in the Guard Artillery Brigade of Berlin. It is around this time that he is reported to have turned a serious eye towards continuing his father's work. Reiswitz Jr.'s efforts would come to fruition in 1824 with the publication of a new edition of Kriegspiel. This included notable changes, such as an increase in the resolution of the map, such that 1 inch now equaled 400 paces, and the reversal away from 3D terrain back to flat maps, which now leveraged the latest in topographic cartography to depict terrain. The most significant changes, however, would be the addition of umpires and dice. To briefly summarize their significance, umpires allowed the otherwise dense and rigid rules to be interpreted and applied in a more flexible manner while dice help model randomness on the battlefield. Let's now discuss each of these in greater detail. The Empire was an important party with great responsibility. First and foremost, they established the wargaming scenario and dictated the size and composition of both forces. 
Reiswitz Jr. was careful to emphasize that the conditions did not have to be balanced and symmetrical as one might expect in a game like chess. Rather, a whole host of more interesting wartime scenarios could be simulated, such as a tactical retreat, an ambush, or even a time-based defense. This fact, in and of itself, vastly expanded the realm of what was possible. Yet that's not all. To quote John Peterson, in addition to establishing the general idea and the composition of opposing forces, the umpire serves as an intermediary for virtually all actions in the game. All movements, all communications, and all attacks channel through the umpire in writing. The players transmit written orders authorized to their units in the persona of a commander, and for the most part the umpire enjoys significant leeway in deciding how these orders will be interpreted. The players begin the game with only such information as the referee deems they might reasonably have garnered, and thus, they are most likely mutually ignorant of the plans and positions of their enemies. Unlike earlier games, the pieces are not set on the board for all parties to see. Instead, the umpire places on the public map only those units of which both sides are aware. Thus. Commanders must issue broad orders to their units and assume that as the enemy is discovered, units will exercise informed discretion. In addition, the umpire makes the all-important decisions about whether or not an attacker has a situational advantage over the defender, determines the ranges for all manner of missile fire, and is the ultimate arbiter of conflict. Their decisions are final, and any critique is shelled for the end of the game. In addition to the umpire, Kriegspiel was further governed by the dictates of dice rolls. This was a huge change from previous games where actions were accompanied by fixed results. Now, results were uncertain. Players were thus forced to think in terms of probabilities, something quite novel at the time, but a critical component for any realistic simulation of warfare. The general mechanics behind the die rolls was that when forces met in combat you would assess their relative strengths, and based on this ratio, you would then roll a particular set of die for say a 1 to 1 or a 2 to 1 encounter. The die would then have specific positive and negative outcomes represented on their faces. The greater your force ratio, the more the specific die set would favor your victory statistically. But of course, this was not a guarantee, unless you had truly overwhelming odds. Similar mechanics were in place to judge the range and effect of artillery fire. All of this was backed by empirical battlefield data being collected at the time. It was all pretty state of the art. Taken together, all these changes revolutionized the world of wargaming. Participants in this simulation were fed imperfect information, had to rely on actual contemporary maps, must give general commands through written dispatches, which were open to interpretation, and faced uncertainty about the results of actions. All of this was groundbreaking at the time, but will sound familiar to many of us today. This very fact is a testament to the importance of Kriegspiel in the history of wargaming. In 1824, upon the official release of this new edition of Kriegspiel, Reiswitz Jr. would make a demonstration before the highest echelons of the Prussian military. In fact, the chief of the Prussian general staff is even recorded as pronouncing that this was quote, no ordinary game, this is schooling for war, I must and will recommend it most warmly to the army. Wargaming was thus on the cusp of mass distribution. But first, it had to be mass produced. To this end, Reiswitz Jr. set up a workshop with painters, carpenters, and a tin foundry and collaborated with the Royal Lithographic Institute to create appropriately sized maps. The final product fit in a compact box 10 inches long and 6 inches wide. In this more practical form, it was able to spread more quickly and rapidly than any of its predecessors. By the late 1800s, Kriegspiel was being translated into many languages as it saw increasing use by military and civilian groups. Today, one can find many people still playing some version of the original Kriegspiel. Even more, engage with its descendants in one form or another of tabletop gaming. There will be much more to discuss when it comes to the history of cartography and even wargaming, but for now, we will have to draw this episode to a close. I've absolutely loved digging deeper into the history of wargaming and cartography in general. I hope you've shared in my fascination. If this sort of thing also interests you, I'd recommend you check out the book Off the Edge of the Map. In it, you can follow the stories of 11 great explorers who set out to push the boundaries of the known world. I'm happy to announce that the book is available through our sponsor, Audible. Audible is the world's largest producer of downloadable audiobooks. They've got a huge trove of history content which you can binge through. 
So let's say you wanted to check out the audiobook on Grid Explorers. The way this works is that you would sign up for a 30-day free trial by going to audible.com slash Invicta or by texting Invicta to 500-500. Doing so will get you your first audiobook for free plus two Audible originals. These originals are exclusive audio titles created by celebrated storytellers from worlds as diverse as theater, journalism, literature, and more. I've personally been using this service as a primer for researching history topics and think it's a great way to learn tons of new things. Definitely check them out and let me know what you think. A huge thanks is also owed to our supporters on Patreon and the many talented researchers, writers, and artists who made this video possible. Please consider contributing to fund future content. If you found this topic interesting, check out these related videos about our fascinating past. Be sure to like and subscribe for more history, and check out our description for ways to support the channel. Thanks for watching.